continuing with our message series this morning, Stranger Things. And just a reminder, we're walking through the book of Acts, and we're taking a look at certain things that are recorded in the book of Acts that maybe don't seem to make a lot of sense. They, they seem relatively strange to us. And so um, we started this uh, about three weeks ago, and, uh, and we looked at something called casting of lots as they were trying to determine who was filling uh, Judas's uh, spot as the apostle. And last week, we looked at the stranger thing that is of the ascension. Um, and with that, it was Jesus rose from the dead, and, and they watched him ascend into heaven. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at something called Pentecost. Now, all of you in here have probably heard that term Pentecost before. Um, Pentecost was a uh, the next Jewish celebration. Uh, the, the Jews had kind of a calendar system, if you will, of different festivals and cele celebrations. And so there's Passover, and then seven weeks after Passover is something called uh, the Feast of Weeks. Okay, and the Feast of Weeks is is literally what it sounds like. Seven weeks after Passover, they have this uh, this celebration, if you will, and it's really a, a celebration of harvest. It's a feast of harvest. So you think of like we're one week past Pentecost now. Stretch it out six weeks from 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 that point, and and what you have is a uh, uh, you're, you're getting into late spring, and and all the crops have have kind of come about, and and people are bringing. Uh, coming from not only throughout Israel, but remember when Israel was dispersed um, in their history, there's people, a lot of Jews that are living outside of Israel. They're all coming to Jerusalem to come to the temple to give thanks for the celebration of, of harvest. And then you, from that, get from the Feast of Weeks, you get this term Pentecost, which literally means 50th, okay? So on, on the 50th day from the time of Passover, something crazy happens. And what's interesting about Pentecost is, you know, we're, we're doing the Stranger Thing message series. It's really Pentecost that is responsible for all these strange things that we're going to see um, in the book of Acts. So let's take a look at this Pentecost event from Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1 through verse 12. So when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were stained in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? This Pentecost event is really one of the most significant events in human history. Not just in terms of the church, but in all of human history, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What could we compare it to? Because if I'm going to be honest, like in the church, and myself included, we don't give this the attention we should. Uh, I would say we ought to compare this to Christmas. Because in Christmas, God comes to this earth in human flesh. In Pentecost, God comes to this earth through the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, when Christmas comes, we have big celebrations, don't we? When, when Christmas comes, uh, you're going to 
have a Christmas tree and put up a Christmas tree. When Christmas comes, you're going to put lights on the outside of the house. You're going to buy Christmas presents. You're going to have a, a Christmas dinner, maybe a Christmas Eve dinner. Ladies, you're going to maybe buy a Christmas dress. Maybe the guys have a, a nice new suit for Christmas. We have a big celebration for Christmas, and so we should, because God comes in, in human flesh to this earth. But when God comes through his Holy Spirit, why aren't we having like a, a significant celebration? We should, because in the same way that, that Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So like in general, we, we probably don't recognize this as significant and as much as we should. And, and once again, like I, I'm guilty of this. And so like remind me in six weeks, because I'll probably overlook it. And you'll be like, you know, Pastor Greg, it's, it's Pentecost. You probably should say something, right? Well, I'm saying it's six weeks early, okay? So it's coming in six weeks. I'm so excited about it. I'm talking about six weeks early. Actually, that's a little bit of a lie. Um, it just comes early in the book of Acts, and we're doing this message series through the book of Acts. And so uh, th that's why we're talking about it today. But probably should have waited to Pentecost to preach this message. What's, what's the significance of Pentecost? I think we've all done this. Remember like being at the lake or wherever and picking up a rock and just chunking it in the water? And when you do it, you see something like this, right? Image, thank you. You got a rock making impact with the water. You got that initial splash, but that's not, like, that's not all there is. You then get the ripple effect that extends out from there. And so for me, like I'm a visual person, right? I, if I think about what this Pentecost event is, you've got God sending his spirit out upon the people. That's like that rock hitting the water, but it ain't done, it's not done yet. Like you get all of these like ripple effects that, that, that spread out from there. And as we read the book of Acts, you're going to see all of these ripple effects from God pouring out his spirit upon this earth. And, and when I got to thinking about this image, then I got to think about something else we like to do when we're by rocks in the water, and that's what? Skip stones, right? And look at that imagery. And I love that imagery. And when, when I look at the Bible, and when I look at how God has worked throughout history, God just seems to uh, intersect humanity at certain times. And when he does, like there's all of these ripple effects. And, and I'm not saying that God isn't always involved in his creation. He is, but there are certain times that, that he seems more involved. And, and some of those times are like when he created the earth, then the time of the flood, the tower of Babel, the calling of Abraham, uh, bringing the people out of Egypt, Moses, you have got King David, you got the destruction of Israel, you have Jesus being born in the Holy Spirit. Like you have these major events and God intersects humanity and there's just all these ramifications. Even when you move post New Testament, you, you've got the division of, of the East and the West, the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic. Then you have the Re Reformation. It seems at the very least every 500 years, God's doing something significant in humanity and these ripples kind of just spread out. And what's cool about this, what's going on in, in Pentecost, and this is why my slides guys were confused because I skipped a slide, but I want to go back and say like in the same way that Jesus, prophet Isaiah prophesies like 700 years before Jesus is born that God's coming to this earth through Jesus, what you have is the prophet Joel prophesying 800 years before this happens that the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. You see, the Bible prophesies Messiah, Jesus coming, but it also prophesies God pouring out the Holy Spirit. So let's go to Acts 2 and let's look, look at this. So Acts 2 is really just a quote from the prophet Joel, okay? And what it says is, in the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters, they're going to prophesy. Your young men, they're going to see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on your servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above. I'll show signs on the earth below, 
Blood, fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming and great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's this intersection of God and humanity, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit, that ripple effect, if you will. Another impact of, of, of Pentecost that, that, that I think is when I'm thinking about the whole Easter event, it, you know, it kind of dawned on me. It's like, you know, you don't have, you, you can't have Pentecost w- without what we celebrated last week. You know, last week we celebrated the crucifixion and the resurrection. Well, something very important happened at that moment that Jesus died. When Jesus said it is finished, we were told it was already dark, but the earth quaked and that there was this curtain that existed in the temple that separated the holy from holies where God dwelt from the rest of people. It was torn in two. I've got a little bit of a, this is over exaggeration of what that looked like, right? So it really would have been like with your eyes, like the curtain ripped. But if you could put on you know, like your spiritual goggles and glasses, you see like God emanating from it. That the, that divide between God and man, it, 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 that, that it no longer exists. That that separation has been torn in two, and now God and man intermingle. And this is the promise then of what Joel says is going to happen. And so, uh, you know, ten days after Jesus ascends into heaven, fifty days after he's crucified, uh, then you have this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to think about the significance of that. If we really understood the significance of Pentecost, I think we would see life differently. You know, do you remember that story in the Bible where Jesus is on the boat with the disciples and he's sleeping and the storm, uh, you know, blows up, the wind's blowing, the water's lapping over, and the disciples are freaking out. They're thinking, we're going to, die. We're going to drown. And they wake up Jesus. And, and, and we're all like, why do you think you're going to drown? I mean, you got Jesus in the boat with you. Now, in fairness to them, they didn't fully understand yet who Jesus was, but at the very least, they saw him do some amazing miracles. So they really shouldn't have been afraid. If they had understood at that time that he's God in flesh, they certainly wouldn't have been afraid. Because if God's with you, what do you have to be afraid of? Well, Jesus is God in flesh. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of God poured out. But listen, they're both God. So if you understand that, like literally, I mean, if we envision Jesus with us and and you're walking into the boss's office and he's firing you, big deal, Jesus is with you. He's like, hey, we'll get through this. Okay, God just told me we're getting through this. I'm okay, right? You're driving down the road and someone's doing some serious road rage. You're probably not that bothered by it if God's in the car with you right? You get bad news from the doctor. You're not real bothered by it when God's in the doctor's office with you. He's like, hey, I'm going to heal you of this. Or, hey, you know what? Remember, I prepared a place for you. This is what your room looks like. You're going there soon, right? One way or the other, you're not overly bothered because like Jesus is there. God's with you. That wouldn't bother you. Well, we could understand that if it's Jesus, but why don't we understand that if it's the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit's God, just as Jesus is God. So I'm here to tell you that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, if you understand that that God is literally living and dwelling with you, it it really ought to put life in a lot more perspective because God is literally with you. Now, for the remainder of our time, here's what we want to do. I want to talk about this event of of the speaking in tongues that go on here in Acts 2. Um, Because... If I'm going to be honest with you, I I think this is something that the modern church uh, has really kind of twisted and gotten wrong. And I I think how we even understand this passage is wrong. And and, and I want to talk to you just a little bit about speaking in tongues. Because I bet you we've all had that experience where you go to like a Christian concert and you're like singing whatever, you know, the, the song is, but that person next to you starts like shaking and start talking like, and what do you don't even know what? It's just a bunch of gibberish. And you're like, I mean, freaking out and like, you know, what's going on? Maybe we've been in a prayer group or a prayer meeting where like someone's praying in English and someone just starts babbling in some like, you know, weird language. Maybe you've gone to a friend's church service. And as part of the church service, some people there like in, in the aisles in the rows start like rolling on the ground, shaking, maybe speaking in some weird language or someone from the stage is like speaking in some weird, and I mean, we're not used to that. We're like, what is, go- I mean, are they possessed? I mean, we're, it's a little disturbing, okay? 
I want to talk a little bit about what that should really look like and, and what Acts 2 is about. And then after that, I want to just talk a little bit more about what it means to have the Holy Spirit poured out on us. All right. So let's first look at this whole speaking in tongues thing. Let's start with Acts 2, verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now, right there, this is why we don't pull passage of scripture out of context. Because when the day, when, when the day, when the feast of, of weeks came and all of these people are coming to Jerusalem, you're probably thinking they is like all the people who come to Jerusalem. But I can tell you that all the people of Jerusalem did not gather in one place. This is not a stadium event, okay? Who are the they? Well, if you want to know who the they is, how, how do we do it in English? Who's the last person that's being talked about? Well, Acts chapter 1 is about how they, the disciples, had to replace Matthias or Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, and they replace him with Matthias. The they is the 12 disciples, Oh, can 12 people be gathered in one place? Yeah, in fact, they can, okay? So the first thing that you need to understand is when this day of Pentecost comes, the they who are gathered together in one place isn't all of Jerusalem. It's not those Cretans. It's not the Arabs. It is the 12 disciples, okay? So they're gathered in one place. Now it says, suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind comes from heaven and it fills a house. You want to know why the, the, the they is the 12 disciples? Not only because they were the last ones mentioned, but they're all in a house. You can't fit the Cretans and the Arabs in the house. All right? You can't fit all the foreigners. It's the disciples. They're gathered in the house, and suddenly there's this loud, rushing, violent wind that fills the whole house where they're sitting, which you're going to see how that's possible here in a second. But it says... As this is going on, they, they all saw, once again, who's the they? It's not all of Israel that's in Jerusalem. We're still talking about the they of, of Acts chapter 1. The, they, the disciples, saw what looked like tongues of fire that separated and, and came on each of them. And they, once again, who's the they? Still the disciples. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So once again, this isn't the Cretans and the Arabs and, 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 and all the other people speaking in tongues. This is the disciples in a house, violent wind, seeing like flames above each other's heads. And the disciples start speaking in these strange tongues as the Spirit enables them. Now, now we're going to change the they. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem. Now we're changing the story from the disciples to those Cretans and Arabs. There were those staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they, now see we switch the they, when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken and utterly Amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking in that strange tongue Galileans? See, that tells us who they were as well, because what was Jesus? Jesus was a Galilean. He was from Galilee. Who were his disciples? From Galilee. The people that are speaking in tongues, they are the, the disciples of Jesus, the Galileans. It's the Galileans who are speaking in tongues. We think of it as this big stadium event where everyone's like speaking in tongues and everyone's hearing them in their native language. Not how it happened. But how do all these foreigners hear what's going on amongst the disciples? Well, I cover this in my Wednesday night class where we were talking about like a lot of the cultural, the historical, um, archaeological understandings of what was going on during the Bible times. And one of the things I shared with them is what the house looked like uh, back in Jesus' day, because it's not like your house. That's what the house looks like. You, you can't fit all of Israel, all of Jerusalem in that thing. Okay? Another difference between their house and yours, besides it's much smaller, it doesn't have a full roof. So, only a part of it has a, has a full roof. So now you have this torrent of a wind from heaven fills that space. There's not a roof on it. Easy for that wind to get in there. 
And some of you have lived in apartments before, and apartments, like you hear everything that's going on above you, beside you, beneath you, whatever. You know, everything's crammed together. Everything's crammed together in these homes. And so what you have is this open, if you can hear those apartment walls, can you imagine when there's not a roof on the thing? And so you've got all the other foreigners that are walking through the city streets and so forth. They hear this violent rushing of wind, and they hear all these people talking in their own language. Why? Because there's not a roof on the thing. You understand what's going on here at Pentecost? And it says, verse 8, how is it? How is it each of us hears them in our native language? And it gets through the whole list of all the people that were there again. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they say, what does this mean? You see how different that is than this kind of understanding that we have that you have all these people that are gathered together in some sort of stadium event and everyone's speaking in a different language, not at all what's going on. You see, here's, here's a big issue with speaking in tongues in the modern churches. It's so disorderly and it's so chaotic. And God is not a God of disorder. He's not a God of chaos. There is intentionality in what God is doing here at Pentecost he says to his disciples, you are to, just before he ascends into heaven, this is what I talked about last week, you are to stay here until you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, God doesn't have to have the violent wind. He doesn't have to have the tongues of fire. And he doesn't have to have these strange tongues. But how would the disciples know when they receive the Holy Spirit? They wouldn't. So God has to use these physical things so that people know, oh, God's doing something. It's like that story in the Bible. Do you remember that story in the Bible where Jesus heals a blind man? And he literally scoops dirt up, he spits in it, makes a little mud and spreads it on the guy's eyes. Kind of disgusting. But he does that so that people, including that guy, knows that he's the one. He, like if Jesus had just said, you know, you're healed, they'd be like, well, was he really this? or what? But by putting that mud on and seeing Jesus do it and then it coming off and like God, they see Jesus did it. We, we just celebrated the Lord's Supper. I mean, do you think that we really have to have bread and wine to realize that, that we receive Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of sins? No. Why do we do it? Well, because th th with the physical, we understand that God's working through it. Do we really need water and baptism to know that Jesus washes away our sins? No, but it, it helps us to understand that as that's going on, God's washing away our sins and pouring out the Holy Spirit. When you anoint someone with oil, a sick person or laying on hands or whatever, or even you go in and you're doing an exorcism in a house and, and someone's putting oil on the door for him, do you really have to have the oil? No, but the way that our minds work, we like to see something physical so that we understand something spiritual is going on. It's like that temple curtain being torn in two. Oh, oh, hey, now God, God can come out. God could have come out anyways, right? But we like to see it. So what's going on here at Pentecost is, is, is it's a God of, he, he's a God of order. He's helping the disciples to know that now you've received the Holy Spirit. Now you can go out and be my witnesses. And he's helping these other people to see that something crazy is going on. Now compare that to how speaking in tongues has evolved in the church. You're at a concert, you're singing a song in English, and some guy's like looking like, like they're, they're just convulsing and saying all kinds of weird things. You go to a church service and same thing during worship, or the speaker gets up and speaks, and he's speaking in some sort of babbling language, and then you're supposed to have a translator. Some person's telling you what that person's saying. Let me, let me just... God's a God of order, right? Not chaos. If the person that's receiving the word understands English, and if it has to be translated into English, why did it ever have to go out of English? If like English can't convey the meaning, well, the translator's just putting it in English anyways. What sense is it? That's, that's, that's disorder. And it's not how God operates. That's why we have the Apostle Paul who, who, who talks about that, that, in fact, he does speak in tongues. He says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But see, everyone wants to, like, I'm a Christian because I speak in tongues. You know why that's such a great gift to show that you're a Christian and, and, and a lot of Pentecostal churches, like, really emphasize? How do you prove it? 
You can't prove it wrong. Like if you say you got the gift of healing, it becomes very clear if you do or don't. If you've got the gift of prophecy, it becomes very clear if you do or don't. Speaking in tongues, who are you to tell me that my babbling's not like a language of angels? And, and, and so the apostle Paul says, listen, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but he says, interesting, when it comes to his prayer language, it's not just all in tongues because it's helpful for him to know what he's saying. And when it comes to worship, he says it really doesn't have a place. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 18 to 19. Paul says this, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So he's like, don't be using that stuff on me. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words. I would, Paul says, I would rather speak five words that people understand than 10,000 words that are in this angel or the language of the angels. So this business that we have turned this into in the church is, is not real faithful to how it's taught to us in Scripture. There can be times and places for it. It is a spiritual gift, but how we use it in the church is, uh, it's really f fake and phony most of the time. So what is the significance of the, this Pentecost event, uh, of the Holy Spirit being poured out on God's earth? The first is this, is through the Holy Spirit being poured out in God's, uh, on the earth, um, it brings faith to people. We've all had those... Um, those people that say, when did you become a believer? When, when did you give your life to the Lord? And you're like, oh, I gave my life to the Lord when I was this. I became a believer when this. Well, whenever you say, I, I came to faith, I believe. Whenever, like, you're taking credit for something God does. And in general, we don't like it when people take credit for what we do. Like at work, if, if you do this big project and your coworker says, I did it, probably going to get you a little upset. Well, when we take credit for what God does, that, that, that's not accurate either. You might think you came to faith. You might think that was something you did, but it's really what God does. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who's speaking by the Spirit of God, anyone who has the Spirit of God in them cannot see Jesus be cursed. If you've got the, literally got the Spirit of God in you, you can't be against Jesus. But in the same way, no one can say Jesus is Lord, except if they have the Holy Spirit. So by the time you get to the point that say, I believe and I have, it's not because of you. It's because God has sent his Holy Spirit in you because you can't believe apart from the Holy Spirit. Faith is a gift from God. It's not something that you do. Second purpose of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. Gifts to be able to... Uh, serve God and his kingdom and the church and so forth. Gifts like healing, gifts like prophecy, gifts like teaching, and even gifts like speaking in tongues. Here's how I want you to understand gifts is God gives all of us gifts and any gift that we have, anything that we're good at, if we're using it to serve God and to serve his kingdom and to serve the church, these are spiritual gifts, gifts that God's spirit gives us to use for the body of Christ. In fact, I say for the body of Christ, we're told in 1 Corinthians 12 that when it comes to gifts, we ought to think of like the human body. When you look at the whole Christian church, it's like a giant body. But even when we look at, say, light of the world church, it's a body. And the body's got different parts. I mean, there's the fingernail, there's the fingers, there's the hand, the arm, you know, the torso, whatever, eyes, ears, mouth. I mean, there's lots of different parts of the body. And the reality is, is like for most parts of the body, you can get by without right? I, I mean, I, I remember when I had surgery on my finger and for like, uh, you know, six weeks or so, I wasn't able to use this hand. I, I just kind of learned, you know, to brush teeth, shave everything like with my left hand. I, I, I wasn't as functional. I wasn't as quick not having it, but it didn't keep me from like living. People can have be blind and not use their eyes. They're, they're not able to do everything in the same way that someone who, who has eyes. They're not as efficient. They're not as quick, uh, but, but, but they're able to do life. And same thing if you can't hear, same thing if like you've lost your arm arms and in war or because of a stroke or, or you, you can get by without legs. But you know what? There's a reason why the Paralympics are different than the Olympics, right? Because someone who has full use of their body has advantage over those who don't. It's just reality. Now, if we've all been given gifts and we're all part of the body of Christ, what happens when some of us aren't using those gifts? 
And this is what I want to challenge you with this morning. Like, if you're coming to light of the world, if you're part of light of the world, certainly if you're a member of light of the world, uh, Are you using your gifts here? I mean, you need to use your gifts out in the community, absolutely, Um, amongst your areas of influence and friends and, and, and whoever. Yes, but how about at the church? I mean, can we get by without you? Yeah. I, I said in the announcement time, listen, we're looking for just a few people to help out once a month for one service for children's ministry. I, I mean, I shouldn't really be having to say that, right? Because there should be everyone serving and there should be an abundance of people doing. So whether it's children's ministry, whether it's praise team, whether it's the coffee team, whether it's, you know, the video booth back there, uh, maybe it's the yard this past week, like that whole fence line. You know, we pay someone that mows that with a tractor, but guess what? No one edges it. So guess who was out there this week edging? It was Pastor Greg, right? And then I, I, I have to do that a few times a year and I don't enjoy it. So yesterday I went to Home Depot and I got that like ground kill for a year, sprayed it out really good. So hopefully I don't have to do it again in like a month or two, right? I mean, there's just always stuff that needs to be done. I was cleaning gutters the other day, right? I mean, I, listen, and you're like, how come you don't ask me? Well, how am I supposed to know to ask you? How about you say, listen, I'm not, you know, I'm not really that involved here. This is something I can do. Let me know if this becomes available. And, you know, I can make a list. And, 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 and next time I'm about to go, you know, work in the field, I'll say, hey, you want to do it instead, right? I mean, if we're all using our gifts, I mean, think about how much more functional the body will be. So I want to challenge you to use your gifts as the Spirit has enabled you to serve God in this place and in your community and in your homes and wherever. Another benefit of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that God has created us to do good works. Part of of having the Spirit in us is that we will do good works. You probably remember that story, you may or may not. Jesus was heading to Jerusalem, and uh, he walks by this tree. I think it was a fig tree. It wasn't producing figs, and Jesus curses it because it's not producing fruit. Um, and when the when they leave from Jerusalem or Bethany or wherever they were going, I don't remember the specifics, but when they walked by, the disciples noticed that that tree that Jesus cursed withered and died. Why did Jesus curse it? Because it's not producing fruit. What good is a fruit tree that doesn't produce fruit? The same thing with us. God's created us to do good works and through the Holy Spirit eh, asks us to do good works. Look at Philippians 2, 13 to 14. For it is God who works in you. How does God work in you? It's through his Holy Spirit. But in you, he's working to will and to act according to his good purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's handiwork. We're created by Christ Jesus, what? To do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So God gives us gifts, and he calls us to put those gifts into good works and into actions. Here's the last significant thing about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God gives us qualities and characteristics uh, that make us more godlike. Look at Galatians 5, 22 to 23. The fruit of the Spirit is this, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, that's not just a random list of qualities and characteristics. Those are actually godly qualities and characteristics that God himself possesses. Because when the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in us, you're hanging out with God, and he can't help but rub off on you and make you a little bit more godly. Just like when your kids like had that new friend, and that new friend wasn't the best influence, and all of a sudden they start talking a, a certain way, and like, where do you learn that from? Oh, so-and-so talks that way, and so-and-so does this. And they become like so-and-so. You kind of do that too. The people you hang out with, you kind of take on a lot of their qualities and characteristics. When God's Holy Spirit's living and dwelling in us, we're actually going to become more godlike, which he's called for us to do. Now, my last challenge to all of us is this. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on all of us, but some of us just don't have room in our house, in our body, and in our heart. It was the same way when God sent his son into this world, wasn't it? Do you remember the story? It was time for Jesus to be born, for God to come into this earth, but the earth didn't really have room for him. In Bethlehem, there's no place for them to stay. They they found like this guy that was renting out rooms and he didn't even have any. There's no room in the inn. So when God comes to this earth, he ends up having to reside in, in a stable and born in a manger. Honestly, when God comes to this earth through his Holy Spirit into our hearts, a lot of us, are quite the same way. 
we're just too busy. Work and looking after the kids and, you know, hobbies and hanging out for friends. We're going, going, and going. And, you know, we just don't have room for the Holy Spirit. Some of us are just way too controlling and we're not willing to allow God's spirit to come in and to transform us and to change us as, as he desires to do. And, and, and so there's no room for God's spirit in our life. If you want to experience some of these stranger things that we're talking about in this series, if you want to feel you know, closer to God, I'm going to challenge you with this. Pray that God would in fact pour his spirit out upon you and make room in your life for him so that when he comes, he might stay. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious almighty God, we just thank and praise you for this morning and to, to hear this amazing story of you coming to this earth through your Holy Spirit. Not only coming to this earth, but coming to each and every one of us. And I pray, gracious God, that we would have room for you. That we would allow you to come and to take up residence in our heart, that we would take on your qualities and characteristics, that we would uh, serve you through our good works, that we would take the gifts that you've given and, and utilize them um, in this church and, and in our communities to carry out your will. We look throughout scripture and people who've made such an amazing impact on this world for you. Uh, the commonality being that they had room for your word and they had room for your spirit and they became vessels by which you worked through them. And I just pray, gracious God, that you do that through us. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.